I think it's just astounding, you know, your film, The Cost of Silence, it just reminds us how this massive event happened 10 years ago in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's been largely overlooked. You know, it, it, there's been so little real discussion about this. Um, why is that? Um, why has this situation been so overlooked? I think that in this day and age in our country, we move from crisis to crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think that out of sight, out of mind, and if it doesn't affect you and it's not in your backyard, then why bother? And having been through the Exxon Valdez oil spill, I saw this is a repeat, this BP Gulf uh, Deepwater Horizon disaster. Um, pretty much the government and the industry wanted the public to believe this is all under control, we've got it cleaned up, we're done, back to the economy, business is normal as quickly as possible, and we're sort of all sacrifice zones. I remember for like years afterward, the you know CEO of BP would be running TV ads, you know, trying to act like everything's okay, we're helping out so much, and you know we're we're getting we're getting better here on the Gulf Coast, but. Not, that's not really the case, you know, and... Uh, Those ads are showing up again, you'll notice, lately. Interesting. Inter why, why, why do you think they've been showing up lately? Because we're here! <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there's, a, there's an expansion. Right. <laughs> and we haven't forgotten. The world, the, the country's largest offshore expansion plan is, is underway. The Trump administration is proposing to expand offshore oil into 95% of all U.S. waters, including all of Alaska waters, the Arctic, and 10,000 feet of water off the eastern seaboard. To do that, they need this story silenced. Yeah. So that, that's an uphill battle you're fighting here. I mean, that's, you know, a lot of forces are arrayed against you. Um, you know, what kind of intimidation have you experienced? Mm, alienation from, um, you know, from our community. As far as that, for me personally, you know, I live in the middle of an oil and gas town and a commercial fishing town, and you know, I've lost a lot of friends because of the advocacy work that I've done to shed light on the subject. Um, they sunk one of my boats, um, slashed my tires on my truck, they've hit my other truck with red paintballs, they've left ugly notes on my vehicle, and when I say they, I don't necessarily think that it's actually the company, but any time that we speak out, um, for an incident like this, a lot of oil and gas field workers, they take that very personally. For me, it's, it's kind of like with the commercial fishing industry, when someone attacks one of my fishermen, I take that very personally, and I think that the oil and gas workers themselves feel the same way. And I don't want Kendra to feel like she's speaking out just for herself. Um, as I was going across, back and forth across the Gulf Coast, and you'll see in Mark's film, I've been back like nine years in a row, twice a year, to f keep following this story. Um, this is the common story of the people who are most outspoken. They're all getting harassed and intimidated, cars being followed, and it's just spooky and it's just eerie and they still keep talking. You know, I think back to when I was a kid, you know, you mentioned the Exxon Valdez spill and, and I remember that loomed very large when, when, I, when I was a kid. That was such a horrible incident, but it was something that was talked about a lot and for years on end. And here is, you know, this horrific oil spill that happens in such a populated area, you know, and maybe it's just that we're moving from crisis to crisis and, and that's why, you know, so much these days and the news cycle is so accelerated and that's why we're not talking about this as much. Or is it that actually the corporations involved now are even that much more powerful that they can silence this? You know, one of the, the, reasons you, you mentioned that and you had the right voice when you gave the commercials. Everything's okay. There's a tone in it. And uh, we came to realize that it wasn't just to convince people to come back and go to the hotels and eat in the restaurants, but it was, um, Ricky pointed out earlier today, it's partly to convince the people who are sick that they're okay too. So they think, oh, well, that's just must be something I have, but, and not realize that everybody was sick. Not so. sick from the oil. You're right. The dispersants. Yep. And the biggest issue here is human health. We're, we're here to talk about the human health effects of this and that has not been addressed really through the history of oil spills and so it is the most important story. I mean we all care about pelicans, we all care about polar bears, but why aren't we talking about human health? And, and the oil companies are spending a lot of effort to keep that story not being talked about. People like Ricky and Kendra 
we're carrying that banner right now. Mark Landon, how did you find Kendra initially? I found Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> and yep. I found Kendra um, when I first went to the Gulf Coast in May, early May of 2010. And I was signing in at a hotel, and I said, uh, the lady's looking, and she goes, Alaska, this is in Venice, Louisiana, where all the fishermen were staging for the in-situ burn team. And she said, Alaska, what are you doing here from Alaska? And I said, well, I'm a fisherman. She said, well, I'm a fisherman. What do you want? And I said, to talk to the fishermen. And four and a half hours later, at the Riverside Cafe in Venice, Louisiana, there was about 50 of you. Uh, and Kendra really reminded me of me, because I was about her age when the Exxon Valdez happened. I didn't know. I was hungry for information. And so for me, it was kind of like payback time, you know, <laughs> pay it forward. And I had a book. And when people started describing the headaches and the nausea and the, and the dizziness that the offshore workers were getting, these, these are not things fishermen complain about or get usually. And I just opened my book and read the exact same symptoms 21 years earlier. And everybody's like, oh, no, we're in trouble. I remember that meeting. That was scary for me. You know, as a young mom, I remember sitting there and Ricky started talking and I raised my hand and I asked her, I said, what do you mean they started to get sick and what were the symptoms and then how long did they stay sick? And she said, we, they lost one in four. And I just lost it. I literally had to get up and walk out of the building. I was just a basket case. I was all over myself. And that's when I decided to start researching and seeing just how much trouble we may be in. What, what hope do you think there is for stopping these expanded offshore drilling plants that the Trump administration is allowing. We're knowledge, optimistic. Knowledge and facts. And, and we wouldn't be here. People should no. not be having any discussions about the development of offshore oil without the knowledge of this event and the suffering of these people. It's, it's, not, a, it's not okay. We're people supposed to need have... the real information. I need to know when you put a period in. I just... <laughs> <laughs> we, we, uh, we supposedly have a national emergency response plan that's supposed to protect our workers. Well, it's 26 years old. Now tell me what emergency response plan is going to be worth its weight with 26 years old. And the 26 years old doesn't account for the air exposures. It only accounts for workers and not really well enough for now and not really the public at all. Children, children are sick. You know, we need a response plan that deals with the whole horror of an oil spill. I think it's important to remember that, I mean, you mentioned it a couple of times, but this event happened 10 years ago. But this story is about what's happening right now. These people are still sick now. We're still losing people now. This is a, this is a story that's happening to us now. Uh, and that's what I think the vitality of the story is. is it's, it's a today story. It's an <coughs> urgent thing that's happening. And, and I think, a tomorrow story. And a tomorrow the next story. next spill, they're going to use this same dispersant. With a, and it's been pre-approved. So if you live anywhere near oil development, offshore and there's an oil spill, they're flying these planes right away, spraying without letting anybody know or asking for any permission. It's been pre-approved. Unlimited amounts. Unlimited amounts. You know, for me personally, why it was so important to continue to speak out was I've, I've watched over the last 10 years my community dwindle from, I mean, the cancer exploded, the cancer rate exploded, healthy people that had nothing wrong with them, we've put them in the ground. And, I mean, that's just not an acceptable scenario for me. You know, from one mom to another, if anybody ever hears what I'm about to say, what I would say to them is, it's not if, it's when this happens again. With the current regulations the way that they are, and the status quo as it goes, this is like a hurricane. It's coming. It may not be this year. It may not be next year that you get the big one. We have an oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico 365 days a year. They're very small most of the time, but it's there. We have infrastructure that's crumbling upon itself, and now we have this administration in the White House that's expanding oil and trying to just spread this stuff everywhere. And it's not if, it's when this happens again. So until we come together as a people and have some systematic change, it's, it's going to be in everybody's backyard eventually. There's a, and, and, sorry. There's a scene in the film we were driving with Kendra. She was driving. We're going from one place to another. It wasn't even supposed to happen, anything. She starts talking about the people on the street that we were driving on. She starts calling out them, their names. And it wasn't like you had to cut the camera to get the next one. It was over here, the James, are, uh, she was in the spill, and her son got sick, and he's got cancer. Oh, and that's so-and-so. And, -so, and or behind that trailer is so-and-so, and they've got 
lung cancer, and there's and it never stopped. It just kept going. We we wanted to have it in the film maybe as an opening, and it went on way too long. I mean, it just kept going. All of her her neighbors just. Oh, it was a long drive. Yeah. yeah. As yeah. a. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sure. Okay, you go ahead. You know, it's difficult for me because I've had to start choosing each weekend. Do I go to a funeral service or do I just send flowers or a sandwich tray or do I spend this weekend with my family? Because this is this is constant. I mean, we went, you know, Katrina, we went from over 16,000 residents to around about 3,000. So we don't have that many of us left. And we're dropping like flies out there. I mean, so, and BPs, they're not held accountable. They're not, there's no follow-up. Oh, they put up these medical facilities <coughs> to make it right. And, you know, every cup of oil is gonna be taken out of your estuary, they told us. And I mean, we still have tarmacs all over the place. Every time we have a storm, this stuff that they disperse into the water column is washing up into our estuaries and then it sinks down into the vegetation and kills it all the way down to the root system. It gets hot outside and it melts and it re it emits these carbon-based fumes back into our community. I mean, we literally live on a peninsula that's surrounded by these estuaries and water on all sides. So we're constantly getting this. And something has to change. And to back this up now with the science, with Exxon Valdez, there was sort of a shot across the bow that dispersants made people sick, but there weren't enough people and there were no long-term studies. And with in the Gulf Coast, this is the first spill really worldwide that scientists have stepped up um, and started at least three longitudinal studies, including one on the Coast Guard, the first responders. These are all healthy, fit young men with a total baseline of their health. And guess what? This, all three studies are showing that oil plus dispersants, which is the response tool, is making everything worse and hurting harm, human health worse than oil, exposure to oil alone. This is not to excuse the industry and say you don't have to do anything after an oil spill, but it's to say we want you to figure out something that will do more good than harm. Because right now, this is not cutting it. Did you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> I love it when you guys have such a rhythm and flow that it's like, I don't even need to do anything. But no, this is actually, you know, this is a case though where I think it is more important to listen because, you know, this is an issue that, I mean, I even, you know, I have a house on the Gulf Coast. That's where I grew up in Florida, and uh, and I was not even aware of any of this. So, um, you know, just put, putting this out there is really meaningful, and uh, and I hope a lot of people do listen going forward. One positive note: we're working together, and we've built an impact campaign, and the film is going to support a number of efforts for people, audience members, to get involved. We have a QR code at the end of the film. They can scan it, go to a page, download an app, and be able to get involved with what Ricky's doing, whatever Kendra might need, whatever people down there might need. It's an imp instant impact campaign. There's not enough to just tell the story. You've got to give people a way to act. And uh, that's called EngageForSolutions.com, and it'll be supporting the actions necessary around this issue. That's right. Informing yourself can just be the first step. And it's essential to vote this year, everybody. Vote, vote, vote. 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 <laughs>